right now from the campus of Eastern Kentucky University, brought to you by WLKY Louisville, WKYT Lexington, and the Kentucky League of Women Voters, a live debate featuring the candidates for Kentucky's race for governor. Now here are Bill Bryant and Vicki Dorch. Good evening, I'm Vicki Dorch, WLKY in Louisville. And I'm Bill Bryant from WKYT in Lexington, and we welcome you to this debate between the candidates for Kentucky's next governor. Tonight, we are on the EKU Center for the Arts stage on the beautiful campus of Eastern Kentucky University. It is their homecoming weekend. Eastern Kentucky University is a co-sponsor of tonight's debate, along with the League of Women Voters in Kentucky. WKYT and WLKY are proud to host tonight's debate. And first, we want to answer a question that many of you have asked. The League of Women Voters policy is to invite candidates whose name will be on the ballot and garner 10% or more support in a nonpartisan poll. The gubernatorial candidates of the Democratic and Republican parties met tonight's criteria. Our audience agreed to hold their applause until the debate is over, except for now, as we introduce the candidates. Republican Matt Bevan. Yeah. And Democrat Jack Conway. All right, gave the audience a little chance to get that out of their system. And now here we go. The candidates have drawn for order of speaking tonight. Each candidate will have time for opening remarks before our round of questions and answers. We'll end by letting each candidate make a closing statement tonight. And you can share your questions and thoughts about tonight's debate as we go along here using the hashtag KYDebate on Twitter. Now we begin our opening remarks with Matt Bevan. Matt, you have one minute for opening statements. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you for Eastern Kentucky University, to all those, the League of Women Voters and others who have put this event together. Grateful for those of you who've taken it out of your evenings to be here with us, for those of you watching on TV as well. We have in a week and a day a tremendous decision to make, one that is going to change this state for the next four, 14, and 40 years to come. And the decisions we're going to talk about, frankly, transcend party. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. You care about jobs in this state. You care about educational opportunities for our young people. You care about the infrastructure. You care about the pension crisis. I would encourage you, please, over the course of the next hour, listen closely. Make a thoughtful, informed decision. Whatever you do, make sure that on November the 3rd, you go out and vote. If you need to learn more as you go through, go to mattbevin.com, M-A-T-T-B-E-V-I-N.com. And I look forward to this conversation. Thank you. And now, Mr. Conway, you have one minute for opening comments. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks to Eastern Kentucky University. Thanks to WKYT and WLKY and to the League of Women Voters. Folks, I want to be your next governor because I understand Kentucky. I have a plan for Kentucky, and I have delivered for Kentucky. I hope during the course of tonight's debate that you'll go to our website at conwayoverly.com. Take a look at the jobs plan that we have put forward. It builds on our core strengths as Kentuckians, takes advantage of what we have here in the beautiful Commonwealth, creates the right type of environment for businesses, and plans for the next generation of workforce. Take a look at the education plan that we've put out that focuses on early childhood education and making certain that kids show up ready for kindergarten. We also want to prepare our 11th and 12th graders for the decisions that they're about to make, and we want to challenge our university system to be even greater. Folks, I've delivered for Kentucky as your Attorney General. I've cut my office's budget by 40 percent, but done more with less. And I'd be honored to have your vote in eight days. All right, candidates, thank you. And now to our questions decided by the League of Women Voters. A reminder that each candidate will have a set amount of time to answer, and then we will give each the opportunity to follow up if needed. Our first question tonight is about health care in Kentucky. More than 400,000 people have enrolled in Medicaid through Connect, Kentucky's version of the Affordable Care Act. Many are from working families who could not otherwise afford health insurance. If you are elected governor, what adjustments will you make? And after next year's re-enrollment period, how many of these citizens do you believe will still be enrolled? Mr. Conway, you answer first. Well, Vicki, thanks for the question. I'm glad we got to this question in this debate. Um, 
The people that are enrolled now will be enrolled in the future. Uh, what Governor Bashir has shown us is that if we do health care reform the Kentucky way and put all the Washington rhetoric aside, that we can actually make it work. And look, Connect has been a shining example of how we can show competence in allowing people to enroll in health insurance. It's three times more efficient than a federal exchange, which is what my opponent favors. We're able to apply consumer protection laws to it. And through the Medicaid expansion, Vicki, we've actually covered about 400,000 more people with health insurance. Now, I agree, we have too many people on Medicaid. But people come off of Medicaid when they get better paying jobs and our economy gets humming. But what I'm not going to do is what my opponent has said he would do in day one of his administration. And that's kick nearly a half million people off of their health insurance based on what we can or can't afford in six years. If we can't afford something down the road, we'll readjust. But to kick them off now would be callous. Mr. Bevan. I would encourage those of you that are here, those of you that are watching at home, what you're hearing already are some more of the very same lies you've been hearing all along. They're the same lies that have been pounding the airwaves on your television sets. You're hearing things that I'm supposedly saying, which in fact I've never said. I've never said I'm going to kick people off of Medicaid in this instance, which is what the question was. We do have a need, however, to make sure that we can pay for the very things that we promise people. Making a promise to somebody that we don't actually have the ability to pay for is a very faulty supposition. It really is. And in fact, to call Connect a shining example is another blatant lie. Just a week ago, buried in eighth paragraph, of a press release that went out before a long weekend was the fact that this very Connect program is collapsing to the tune of $150 million that is going to fall ultimately back on the taxpayers in this room and those of you watching at home. It is not a shining example. It's not working. We need 1115 waivers to ensure that we can provide the same coverage to more folks but at a more affordable uh, cost to the taxpayers of Kentucky. Mr. Conway, Please, let me have a rebuttal there because uh, while the co-op may be going out of business. There's no $150 million collapse uh, imminent in Connect. That is just not true. And an 1115 waiver, folks, is a demonstration waiver. We already have some of those going right now, but you know what? It won't save us any money. That's just a red herring. And Matt, that video camera caught you at the start of your campaign. When asked about Steve Bashir's executive order to expand Medicaid, you said, absolutely. No question about it. I would reverse that immediately. Now, you owe the people an explanation. How's that not going to kick nearly a half million people off their health coverage? Again, you notice whenever you've heard this in one of his ads, you never hear the person actually ask the question. And this is typical. You don't hear the question. You hear a snipped out word or two to make it look like I'm responding to something otherwise. The bottom line is this. There is going to be a cost. And unfortunately, liberals often believe that whenever federal money or taxpayer money is lost because something collapses, that there's no cost to anybody, that somehow it's free money. It's not free money. It's your money. And indeed, there is going to be a cost. And the fact that you're unaware of how much it's going to cost the taxpayers of the state is a remarkable example right. of how unprepared you the are for this time. We're, we're, the end of the co-op will not cost Kentucky taxpayers anything. All right, we're going to move on, but we are going to stay with this uh, set of issues. Health care is uh, very important, and the landscape is changing. There's no question about that. We recently learned, as was mentioned, that the Kentucky Health Care Cooperative, the one nonprofit insurance company that signed up patients for health insurance under the ACA will go out of business at the end of the year. Uh, what is your take on the cause of its failure? What impact will that have on those uh, who have used it to have access to health care, Mr. Bevan? The reason it collapsed is because anything that is subsidized with your money, taxpayer money, and cannot cash flow itself based on its actual business model, and this is something that career politicians frankly don't understand, that there's not enough of other people's money to pay for all these things. When, in fact, there is not enough to subsidize this, it collapses. This is exactly what happened. There was a promise or an expectation of federal dollars, free dollars coming from the taxpayers that did not, in fact, materialize, and therefore the system collapsed. The comment that this is somehow three and a half times more efficient than the Connect program, the Connect is more efficient than the federal program, is an absolute falsehood. The reality is only 2% of qualified health plans in this state are served through the Connect program. 98% of you are paying for the 2%. That's what seems to make it more efficient, but the actual cost, it's an apple and an orange, and it's important for you to be informed on this topic. There is no free lunch at the end of the day. Mr. Conway, your answer to the question. Well, first of all, <clears throat> Connect is more efficient than a federal exchange. 
I mean, there was a 1% charge on premiums that was already there to fund the high-risk pool. That and federal grants paid for Connect. There's a th over a 3% charge in the federal exchange. So yes, it is more efficient. We have connectors meeting the needs of Kentucky consumers. You can apply the State Consumer Protection Act to it. It's much preferable to the federal exchange. And with regard to the co-op going out of business, listen, there were market forces at play. I don't think they had adequate reserves. I'm not convinced that the co-op was managed very well. However, for this upcoming enrollment period, we have seven, we have seven private insurers competing for the business of Kentuckians. I can remember back in the 1990s when we didn't have that type of competition in this state. And it's clear that no state dollars are going to be used on wrapping up the co-op. All the claims are going to be paid. And the fact of the matter is the grant monies that propped up the co-ops were defunded in Washington by the Republicans recently. So that's one of the things that contributed to it. Rebuttal, I, mean, I, mean, I do want to respond to this because trying to blame this on a party is absolutely ridiculous, Jack. It really is. This is not about a Republican or Democrat thing. The people we're talking about are Republicans and Democrats. Sure. There's a lot of scare tactics about people being thrown off. The people who have been thrown out of their health care in the last several years have been thrown off their health care because of Obamacare. That's the reality of it. Hundreds of thousands have lost their health care. The 51,000 people on this exchange have lost their health care. They are going to pay significantly more starting at the top of next year. This is a reality. The reason these things cost more in the end is because taxpayer money is not enough to subsidize what the free market needs to dictate. Well, while we're talking about people losing their health care, if my opponent is elected, nearly half a million Kentuckians are going to lose their health care. They already have, Jack. That's the point. No, we're going to move I'm on not to talking the about half. the Medicaid expansion. Now. I'm talking about the Medicaid expansion. Yeah. I'm not talking about the co-ops. I'm talking about the Medicaid expansion, yeah, the where, you haven't, shot, the where money, you haven't shot straight with the people There's, there's not long. enough free money in the liberal pot, Jack. There just isn't. <laughs> Our next question deals with Medicaid. Medicaid provides more than just health care for children and families. It's also a major funder of services for the elderly and physically and mentally disabled adults. Several thousand adults with intellectual and development challenges in Kentucky are on a waiting list to get Medicaid assistance for long-term services. Would you make it a priority to support these vulnerable Kentucky citizens? Mr. Conway. I would make it a priority to service all of our vulnerable citizens um, through Medicaid. I want to make certain that people that are entitled to be covered are covered. And with the Medicaid expansion, we're seeing additional things um, being treated here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We're seeing an unhealthy population actually pr participate in preventive care for the first time in their lives. There is more money now for mental health treatment, which I think is a good thing. And look, I know that there's no free lunch, Matt, but the Deloitte company took a look at our health care expansion here and said we're going to create 40,000 jobs and have 30 billion dollars in new revenue as a result, 30 billion dollars in new ec economic activity as a result of more people being covered. And one of the other things that's being covered now by Medicaid is substance abuse treatment. Folks, I've worked hard as your Attorney General because I know that we have only one-tenth of the treatment beds that we need. When I've won, when I've won settlements with pharmaceutical companies, we've actually put the money toward more adolescent treatment, juvenile treatment, saved women centers. I'm passionate about treatment and I will also stand up for treatment through Medicaid. Mr. Bevan. It's important to understand that the question as it relates to the most vulnerable among our population is a very good one because this is exactly what Medicaid is for. Medicaid is not intended to have working aged able-bodied people like Jack and myself drawing these benefits and then they come at the expense of those like those you've described. We do have people on waiting lists. We have people on waiting lists for Michelle P. waivers that are very specific in this state that frankly people had to sue in order to be able to get access to and yet even now there's not enough funding for this. This is a very real issue. Demographics dictate that this is going to become a bigger issue. This Deloitte and Touche study was baloney when it was first written, even more so now in light of the health care co-op collapsing. It is completely statistically irrelevant. And for you to continue to quote it is, again, indicative of the fact you truly don't know what you're talking about. But as it relates to Medicaid, the bottom line is this. We spend less than 1%. About 1% of all Medicaid dollars on behavioral health in this state. It's not enough. We need to spend more money where it is needed, not where it's not, to ensure that we have enough to actually take care of the need in our state. And Mr. Conway, we'll allow a, a quick follow up. <laughs> Well, from the last debate, I couldn't tell if my opponent knew the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. So for him to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, that seems interesting. But uh, let me say this. That Deloitte study was done in a nonpartisan way. It was done in a nonpartisan way, and they took a look at the increased uh, activity in and around health care, 
And for the first year in fiscal 2017, when we have to pick up some of the costs of the Medicaid expansion, we're still $177 million to the black. Kentucky is getting healthier. It helps our general fund, and the expansion of Medicaid was the right thing to do, and we shouldn't kick a half a million people off their health insurance. Again, I would simply say, look at the math. The math matters. Clearly, the people who prep you for these debates have not read what the impact is going to be because you cannot have a loss of this co-op so heavily subsidized by federal dollars. That was a distinct part of Deloitte and Touche's assessment as to why this supposedly paid for itself. But the paying for itself, again, I would remind you as those that are here and those that are watching, these are your dollars. Federal dollars are not free dollars. They come out of your pocket. And when a system collapses and that money is lost, it is your money that is lost. There the, is no free lunch. The co-op was designed to be the not-for-profit option to encourage competition. Just because the co-op has gone under doesn't mean the whole system has failed. I'm not saying the whole system has failed, but it's important to understand there is a cost to these dollars that have been lost. They are coming from the taxpayers. That is an important distinction between you right, and I. We're, you we're, imagine that they're free magic dollars. We're going to move on to our next, uh, next question. They're not. Uh, the Kentucky retirement system is underfunded by $9.1 billion. That's the estimate. The Kentucky teachers' retirement system underfunded by $14 billion. Those employees made their contributions. The state has not uh, kept up appropriately. Uh, what is your plan to bring these systems back in balance to assure that Kentucky keeps its promise to its long long-term employees. And we'll begin with uh, Mr. Bevan. The most important thing to do is stop digging. Simple as that. We have a, people hear about the inviolable contract. It's a very real thing. We have a legal and a moral obligation to make the payments to our retirees and to those that are currently working. That I've been clear on from the very beginning. We have a legal and moral obligation to fulfill the promise that has been made for every teacher, for every highway worker, for every Kentucky state policeman, for whatever the case might be. Every one of these individuals is owed a debt by the people of this state based on legislation that has been in place. We are indeed severely underfunded, the second or worst underfunded relative to any other in the state in the country. And so to that end, it is imperative that we stop digging. There is no way that we can continue because of demographics to offer the same plan to people who are not currently state employees. To offer that to folks not yet employees is to ensure that neither they, the current workers, or the retirees will get what has been promised to them. Mr. Conway, state retirements. Well, <clears throat> it's important to note that we already have stopped digging in some respects. Uh, twice over the last six years, uh, policymakers in Frankfurt have looked at the Kentucky employees' retirement systems, and they've changed the rules. There's no longer any double dipping. People have to work longer. And what we now have is something that was recommended by the Pew Foundation on the states, and that is a hybrid plan, part defined benefit, part defined contribution. It takes care of the problem in the out years. But what we have is this bubble over the next 15 years, because what happened in Frankfurt is policymakers made assumptions about investment returns. They thought they didn't have to make the actuarial required contribution. And then the market crashed in 2008, and we found ourselves behind the eight ball. So we're going to have to monitor this. We're going to have to make the ARC payment in each and every year of the budgets moving forward for the next decade and a half. We're projecting a $219 million surplus next year. The payment is $66 million. We can do that, and the state employees' retirement system issue is manageable, in my opinion. Let me touch on one thing real quickly. The word monitor is used often in these debates. It's used often by Jack, and you'll probably hear it again. We need to stop monitoring things. We all know we're in trouble. We know the system is collapsing. We know that we're on the cusp of insolvency. This is the reality of it. I'm the only one on this stage that's ever worked in the pension business. I started an investment management firm in this state in the basement of my home that manages more than $5 billion in pension assets. I understand this. I understand the difference between a defined benefit and defined contribution plan and what we as a state need to do to ensure that we meet the promises that we've made to our workers. Well, Matt, just because you managed pension funds as a fund manager doesn't make you a pension expert. In fact, the Not Frankfurt State that. Journal looked at this and said that you took millions of dollars in fees and got mediocre results. They called your results less than stellar. So that does not make you an expert. 
But look, yes, we are going to have to monitor this, but we're going to have to stand by our commitment to our retirees. And what I'm not going to do is what my opponent proposes, which is a 401k style system, which the retirement system has already studied and says costs $8 billion more over the next 15 years. I'd like to move on to our next question. Some people believe the process of redistricting with gerrymandering allows lawmakers to choose the voters instead of voters choosing their legislators. Would you support creation of a nonpartisan commission on redistricting to draw district lines? Why and why not? Mr. Conway. Well, Vicki, that's ultimately a legislative decision. And as um, as governor, I'm going to have to work with the legislature, and I know that's the most political of processes, the, the redistricting process. But I do support the idea of having a nonpartisan commission either set the lines or maybe come up with recommendations for the legislature beforehand so they can put out there what's fair. And then when the legislature comes in to redistrict, people can hold them accountable vis-a-vis -vis what an independent commission recommended. But I do think there is too much gerrymandering. I do think there is too much horse trading and redistricting. And that we need true competition in most of these districts so that we can have the public discourse and the dialogue on the important issues that I think people are really yearning for in our democracy. A lot of that is lost today because if you look at what's going on in Washington, they've redistricted themselves to a point where they've got nothing but the extremes of both parties on either sides and not a lot is getting done. And I think redistricting is a big part of that. Mr. Bevan. Absolutely, yes, the answer is that I would support such. I think we play too many games. If you're out there tonight and you're fed up with career politicians, you have a choice in this race. If you're tired with people who play games to maintain power, regardless of party, both sides do this. If you're fed up with this, we're offering you a very distinct difference. And I would challenge you, going back to the last point, since it doesn't take me long to say yes, to think about the fact that only one of us on this stage has actually ever offered a solution to the pension crisis. Only one of us. People may not like that solution, but monitoring is not a solution. It's not a solution. It is imperative that we address this crisis. It is the number one issue facing our state because every dollar we go in to shoring up an insolvent pension system is a dollar that doesn't patch a pothole, it's a dollar that doesn't buy a textbook. It's a dollar that doesn't put a uniform on our first line defenders. The bottom line is we have to fix the pension crisis. Monitoring it will not cut it. Well, let me, let me jump in there just for a second, Quickly. Bill. Look, these changes to the pension system are just a couple of years old. They look like they're solving the problem in the out years, yet we still have the obligation what to retirees. We're talking 20 years down the road, Matt. So it looks like it has started to solve the problem. So we have to watch this. If it's working, great. If it's not, we need to tweak it and change it. But we can't go to a 401k style system, which the retirement system has studied and says costs $8 billion more to, the, more to the Commonwealth over the next 15 years. Almost a quarter of a million Kentucky citizens, uh, many of color, have been disenfranchised because they committed a felony at some time in their lives, maybe when they were very young. Uh, we have heard both of you say that you support restoration of voting rights for former felons. Uh, would you impose any other restrictions in granting this right, such as a three-year waiting period, which was suggested in the legislature during the session earlier this year? Mr. Bevan. I think three years is too long. I do support voter uh, restoration. I do also support the restoration of the right to keep and bear arms for nonviolent offenders. I also believe very firmly in expungement. America is a, is a land of second chances. This is a land of redemption. We have already created a subclass of people in this state, 180,000 plus, who currently, as because of their felony record, do not have the ability to participate in the Democrat process, the democratic process of electing folks, the ability to have all their cons constitutional rights available to them. For nonviolent offenders, I am an absolute supporter of, and from the Republican side of the equation, this has not typically been the case. But I do not intend to just simply sign such legislation. I in intend to ensure that such legislation is actually shepherded through the legislature and passed when I'm the governor of this state. Mr. Conway, on restoration of uh, voting rights. I support the restoration of voting rights for nonviolent felons. I think that once they've completed their parole and their, their sentence is up, it's up. They've paid their debt to society. Now, I'm not talking about the most heinous and violent of crimes, but for nonviolent offenders, I think once their sentence is up, it's up and they ought to be able to vote. And it ought to automatically return to them and there ought not be a three-year waiting period or anything like that. When I'm your next governor, I will be very aggressive at looking at expungement and making certain that we do not have nonviolent uh, offenses on the books that are keeping people from getting a job, because that's what a lot of this is about. 
And also, the fact that v felons can't vote disproportionately affects the African American community. And I know that disenfranchisement is very personal to that particular community. And I think it's the right thing to do to return those voting rights that are so important to people of all colors. We're on the campus of Eastern Kentucky University, so let's talk about the cost of college education. Kentucky students graduate college often with thousands of dollars in student loans. Today's economy requires a better educated workforce with at least some college or technical training. Not only has state funding for higher education in the Commonwealth been cut by $170 million since 2008, but in the past fiscal year, Kentucky was tied with West Virginia for the largest percentage cut to higher education of any state. What are your plans, if any, to restore higher education state funding? Mr. Conway. Well, times are tough in Frankfurt, let me say that. And there's not enough money to go around for everything, okay? Matt, I do understand that, all right? Uh, one of the things that I would like to do in my first budget that I don't know that I'm gonna be able to do would be to restore Bucks for Brains funding because I think investing in, in that type of of entrepreneurship and in those type of endowed professorships at the universities really pays economic development dividends. And as I said earlier, we're projecting a $219 million surplus in the next fiscal year. I will have two major priorities for that money. Number one will be the ARC payment for the pensions. Secondly will be education, particularly early childhood education. And then if some is left over, we will look at restoring some of the cuts to higher education. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver though because the higher education institutions are gonna to have to get more efficient. We're gonna to have to do a better job of counseling 11th and 12th graders about loans they're about to take out and the fact that that debt can follow them around for the rest of their lives. And I want our higher education system to function as that, a system that looks out for one another. Mr. Bevan. It's critical. There's two things that will separate us as a state from where we are now to where we wanna be. Simple as that. There, if we as a state do not invest significantly in education and in infrastructure, we will continue to fall back relative not only to what we might be, but relative to the states around us. Higher education is critical. We are increasing the cost at every turn because we have so heavily subsidized this at the federal level. If you want more of something, you subsidize it. And indeed, we have created higher and higher pressure on the cost of higher education. We as a state spend $1 billion a year of our taxpayer money on post-secondary education. But we don't discriminate whether you want to study French literature or whether you want to study electrical engineering. We need to start doing so with the taxpayer's money. I'm a strong supporter of outcomes-based funding, and as we restore these dollars to our institutions of higher learning, that we will do so in a way that incentivizes them to graduate in a timely manner students with the degrees necessary to be productive in the workforce. We're uh, all appreciative here of a considerable presence of law enforcement tonight uh, for an event uh, such as this. Uh, these are the times we live in. And given the rise in security issues at American colleges and universities, including a recent threat that shut down this university campus, how do you intend to help support Kentucky's public institutions in preparing for emergencies and enhancing safety and security resources to help students be able to live and learn in a safe and controlled environment? Mr. Bevan. I'll tell you this, the Second Amendment is an extraordinary amendment. It's 27 simple words, the last four of which shall not be infringed, I firmly believe. I'm the only one on this stage with the endorsement of the NRA, and I mention that because this is an issue important to them as well. We do have a tremendous rash of bad behavior as it relates to not only our campuses but beyond. We need to support our law enforcement officers. I wore this nation's uniform as an active duty military officer. I have tremendous respect and appreciation for those that will go every day, put on a uniform, and do a job that other people are unwilling or unable to do. They need our absolute support. But as it relates to securing our campuses, I am a proponent of allowing people to conceal carry on college campuses in this state, on our other campuses, to have teachers who are trained as we allow our pilots in cockpits to be trained, not just indiscriminately, but through a rigorous training process to be able to be that first line of defense so that we don't have target opportunities so readily available to those that want to wreak evil upon our students. Mr. Conway, security on college campuses. Well, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment as well. Uh, I am also the only person on this stage that has the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that they endorse me is because I understand how important incentive pay training and having 40 hours a year of continuing training for law enforcement is. 
and I appreciate their endorsement, and I appreciate them standing behind me in this particular election. One of the most important things that we can do for school safety in places like Eastern Kentucky University is to have a plan, to have a plan, to think about possible outcomes, to look at scenarios, and have a plan and be ready for that. In fact, about 16, 17 years ago, I worked with Harry Marbley, who I see out in the audience tonight, who's long been a proponent of Eastern Kentucky University, and we created the Center for School Safety right here at Eastern Kentucky University so those contingency plans can be developed so that we could work with teachers and administrators to make certain that we know what the best practices are and then God forbid anything like that ever happen we will be ready with a particular plan. We invite you to share your thoughts and questions <clears throat> using the hashtag KY debate on Twitter. Kevin Kays wants to know if the candidates would support medical marijuana for patients with epilepsy, cancer and other medical needs. Mr. Conway. I do not support medical marijuana. Now, let me be clear. Uh, I've supported cannabidiol oil and some of the oils that, that deal with seizures. I even worked with Commissioner Comer to help market hemp. But I am not a supporter of medical marijuana. Um, medical marijuana is the only medicine I could think of that would be prescribed in joints. Uh, secondly, you know, I, I've been in front of 40, 45,000 kids all around the state talking to them about the dangers of, of prescription drug abuse. And when I've met addicts or people that are having problems in their families, it always seems like it started with marijuana at an early age. And finally, Vicki, and most importantly, I worked in a bipartisan fashion a few years ago to pass House Bill 1. It gave us new tools to shut down half the state's pain clinics and to actually get our doctors to check Casper. The Kentucky Medical Association, which represents the doctors, lobbied us so hard on that. They were waiting outside of my office. I have not heard the first thing from the Kentucky Medical Association or the medical community that says that we need medical marijuana. Until I hear from them, I'm not going to be for it. Mr. Bevan. The question was asked about the support of medical marijuana. I would sign such legislation. I do think there is unequivocal medical evidence of the fact that there are benefits for some of the very folks that you've described, those with cancer, those with epilepsy. It's unequivocal. I think it should be prescribed like any other prescription drug. I think it should be regulated in the very same fashion. But if, in fact, it were, then I would, in fact, sign such legislation into law. With respect to recreational marijuana, which is what I think you were referring to when you talk about how people start on drug problems, this is a very different story. A kid on, with epilepsy, a kid with terminal brain cancer, these are not kids that I'm worried about starting off on a life of drug addiction. These are kids who need help. And I would absolutely sign such legislation, but I would never, ever in this state sign legislation encouraging the use of recreational marijuana. Well, let me just say this. I, I was talking about medical marijuana. And if we passed a law for medical marijuana, it would be easier to get on our streets. Okay? And, and when you talk about our kids, look, I've been in front of 45,000 kids the last few years. You know, I heard we lost an entire generation of prescription pill, oh, prescription pill addiction, so I went on the road with two mothers from Moorhead who lost their own children. I've had children cry on my shoulder in our high schools because of what they're facing. I understand what hurts kids, and I don't want to do anything that would have the potential to hurt our children. I want to make one final comment to this, because I'll tell you, we're on the campus of a university, and I'm not going to ask for the young people in this room to raise your hands, but is it not already, ready, already easy for you to find this on the streets? Come on. Who are we kidding? The only people who can't get it are the people who abide by the law. The only people who can't get it are these families who want some medical relief for members of their family. The idea that we're saving this from getting out on the street, Jack, is a tremendous misunderstanding of the question that's being asked. All right, uh, another question now submitted on Twitter, and we enjoy the fact that uh, this is interactive, and uh, many of you are uh, taking part in uh, letting us know how you feel about uh, tonight's debate and also submitting some questions. The next governor will make hundreds of appointments, and uh, Jack Hendricks, a veteran, wants to know if the candidates would keep Heather French Henry uh, as the Veterans Affairs Commissioner of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. <laughs> Mr. Bevan. That is a remarkably specific question. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you this, I know Heather French Henry. She's an incredible woman. I heard her first speak many years ago when she spoke at Zachary Taylor on Memorial Day uh, for Memorial Day service. An incredible person, incredible heart, incredibly dedicated to veterans. Somebody who, because of her father and others in her family, has a real heart for this. I've had occasion to speak with her about this on many occasions. I will also say that I have made no promise to anybody anywhere that I'm going to keep them in a position or put them in a position. There is not a person in the state of Kentucky who is under the assumption that I'm going to appoint them to anything at this point. 
And it's important to understand that if you want to elect a governor that will arrive in Frankfurt unencumbered by anybody, unbeholden to any interest groups, not having made promises that need to be re returned in, in kind, that it is important that we elect somebody who's an outsider and not a career politician. Mr. <coughs> Conway, would Heather French Henry be your Veterans Affairs Commissioner? <laughs> well, I'd have to sit down and talk to Heather about that. <laughs> <laughs> Heather's a wonderful person. I've known her for many years. And uh, she has an unmistakable commitment to our veterans. And if she wants to stay involved in Veterans Affairs in some way, then I'm going to make certain she stays involved because she's an important voice. Um, I think most importantly, though, is for people in a state like Kentucky, uh, where we have a lot of veterans, to understand my commitment to veterans. Uh, my father guarded missile silos in Germany in the 1960s. He came back and relocated to Jefferson County and was teaching at Fairdale High School. He was teaching history, and then he put himself through law school at night on the GI Bill. And I'm the beneficiary of that GI Bill because uh, it created opportunities for our family, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the GI Bill. And so as your Attorney General, I've been active in the National Association of Attorneys General. It's known as NAG, one of the more unfortunate acronyms we have in American politics. But, uh, but I've been the chair of the Veterans Affairs uh, Committee. I was the first attorney general in the country to put up a consumer protection toolkit for our veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan so that they knew their rights financially when they got back. I would say in five seconds, I'm the only one on the stage that is a military veteran. I understand this from personal experience, not because of some generational past, but because I've walked in those boots, literally. I've worn that uniform as an active duty Army officer. And I'm committed to ensuring that I listen to the voices of those who have actually served this nation in uniform and am determined to put forward the absolute best solutions to taking care of veterans in this state, all 340,000 of them. And I, honor, and I honor your service. Thank you, Matt. The achievement gaps between students living in poverty and those not between white students and students of color are unacceptable. What will your education plan do to close those gaps? Mr. Conway. Well, first of all, I am the candidate on the stage that is committed to early childhood education. I can thank Vicki of nothing more important that we could do to break the cycle of poverty in places like Eastern Kentucky or West Louisville than focus on early childhood education. Because the science is clear. 90% of brain function is actually wired by the age of five. The, the child that shows up ready for kindergarten likely will go on to test well in grade school, go on to be college and career ready. So making that investment in the early years really will help close that achievement gap. We need, if we see failing schools, we need to put in distinguished educators. We need to do everything we can to stand up for our teachers, and I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Kentucky Education Association and teachers throughout the state. But folks, there is a big, big difference on early childhood education between these two candidates. I want to make it a priority for my administration, and I have an opponent who's on record as saying that it serves no purpose. Mr. Bevan? Again, this is one of those Democrat lies that you're going to keep hearing. You've heard 12 plus million dollars worth of them already on TV. I apologize for that. Uh, you're going to hear more. This is the same man who brought you Aqua Buddha, so get ready, we're getting closer. The bottom line is it's going to keep heightening the kind of lies that you're going to be told. I've never ever said that I'm not a proponent of early childhood education. What I've said is that every single study that has ever been done, including by the government themselves, when studying the Head Start program specifically, has shown that it serves no purpose beyond the third grade. That's what I said. You can clip three words out of that and make it say whatever you want it to say, but that's a lie and you do a lot of that. The bottom line is this, I'm a big proponent, I have nine children. Of course I care about early childhood education. It's imperative. As I said earlier, the things that separate us from where we are and where we're going to be is education and infrastructure. It is imperative that we invest. There's a program in Northern Kentucky, Success by Six and the United Way are working with Skyward to pioneer an alternative to the current structure so that we can be better stewards of the dollars we spend. I'm not proposing spending less, I'm saying let us spend those dollars more wisely. Well, let me say this. Uh, a lot of the children that are eligible for Head Start aren't on it. And we have only 16,000 uh, children on Head Start in this state, and about, I guess, maybe 60 to 70 percent of those that are eligible aren't on it. But, Matt, you were very clear in the KET debate 
in the spring that you felt like Head Start served no purpose. The science the actually, goes, grade, actually yeah. goes the other way. And just on Monday night, in a debate between my running mate and yours, Mrs. Hampton basically said she wanted to eliminate early childhood education and rely on parents to get their kids ready for grammar school. That's the wrong solution okay. for people that are in poverty in Kentucky. Interestingly, the League of Women Voters had asked us to make this issue a priority. This is one of the questions that they wanted to ask. So we'll continue on this, uh, this uh, track just a little bit. Uh, this reference was made to this debate uh, uh, between the candidates uh, for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Ms. Overly said that the Conway administration, if there's to be one, would increase access to preschool. Ms. Hampton was asked whether she believes public schooling uh, should begin in kindergarten or first grade, and she said, we would look at it before we make any decisions. Do your plans then call for state-funded preschool, uh, provide access uh, for more children, uh, maintain it as it is, uh, reduce it, eliminate it? Uh, where would you go on, on uh, early childhood education? Mr. Bevan. Again, as I've said, we need to spend the dollars in education from early childhood education through post-secondary education. This is a fact. And the question is, we need to, how, how are we going to best prepare young people? And it's Ms. Hampton, not Mrs. Hampton, by the way, but the bottom line is this. It's important for us to understand that if we do not prepare young people for the schoolroom when they first arrive, they're not going to be prepared at third grade, eighth grade, or for the post-secondary world. The ultimate reason that we use taxpayer money to educate people is because we need to ensure that young people are prepared ultimately to be able to care for themselves to not become financial wards of the state, but to be productive citizens and have the skills and the training necessary. From every stage, it's imperative that we do so. That's why I like this program being pioneered, and there are others like it, where we can use the same amount of dollars, use them more wisely, more thoughtfully, in a more targeted way to get better results, better returns on the taxpayer investment. This is imperative if we are to have the success we need as a state going into the future. Mr. Conway. Uh, Bill, researchers in Michigan recently did a very famous study. It's known as the 30 million word gap. The researchers went into welfare homes, typically single parents. Maybe they didn't have good reading skills themselves. And then they went into middle class homes. And they monitored children between the ages of six months and 42 months. And the difference between those two cohorts was 30 million words. 30 million words on average per child. The reason, folks, that is so impactful is because a child's brain is literally making the synaptic connections that put it on a path toward lifelong learning. What we do at ages three and four is critically important. And I said to you earlier tonight, we're going to have a surplus next year. My priorities are the ARC funding and this. We need to do more in Kentucky. And I'm not talking about for everybody. Look, I'll take care of my girls' preschool. We can't even afford all-day kindergarten in all of our school districts. But in a Conway administration, my goal, my goal will be at 200% of federal poverty level and, bef and below, three and four-year-olds are eligible for early learning experiences. Let's stay on this topic. The 2015 Kids Count report that 25% of Kentucky children live in households below the federal poverty level. What will you do to address child poverty and reduce its long-term negative impact on children, helping them escape the cycle of poverty? Mr. Conway. Well, one of the first things that we can do, Vicki, is to take a look at the child care assistance money that's available. You know, some parents get get stipends for child care assistance if they want to go out and work a job. I mean, child care is one of the biggest impediments to parents being able to hold the job and provide for their kids. So as we look at children in poverty, we need to make certain that the child care assistance program in the Cabinet for Health and Family Services is adequately funded, that we're doing everything that we can. Secondly, this early childhood learning program helps break the cycle of poverty. One of the reasons that poverty gets so entrenched in certain neighborhoods or in so certain regions is we don't value education enough and the doors that education can open. And so this is not a project that any governor is ever going to cut a ribbon on. But you know what? If we focus on this for the next four years, if we make the right kind of investments, it could make a fundamental difference in Kentucky. Because the studies show that for every dollar, every dollar we invest in early childhood education, society reaps seven in return. I mean, it's, it's, I think, I hope you understand at this point, we both agree that we need early childhood education. All of the science is true enough, but the question is, what is the delivery vehicle? What is the way that we're going to ensure that we actually reach these young people with an education that produces the results that we need and want? I'm the only one on this stage that grew up below the poverty level. This is something that I'm not just sympathetic to or speak about anecdotally. I understand it from first-hand experience. I never had health insurance of any kind in my life until I was an active duty army officer when I was in my 20s. 
This is something that I come from. It is a real thing to me. I understand it. I know for a fact that what we owe people is the opportunity, jobs, and economic leg up. We need to ensure that the lowest rungs of the ladder actually exist because there is dignity that comes from the expectation and the opportunity for one to do from themselves. And when we rob people of that dignity, we take away their humanity. And that's what ultimately leads to so many of these bad decisions. We've got to invest heavily, but we have to invest wisely. And that's the big difference. Let's move now to the uh, next question. Another uh, question submitted by the uh, League of Women Voters, or to the League of Women Voters. I'm having, Bill, Kentucky, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm yes, we're, if, if security can handle that issue in the audience, please. Another uh, question submitted uh, from the League. Many Kentucky families need quality child care uh, where their children uh, can learn and grow. Low-income working families are hindered by a lack of access to child care. What support would you provide to give families access to safe, affordable, uh, high-quality child care? Mr. Bevan. I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that question. Many <laughs> families uh, need access to child care uh, in order to uh, be able to learn and grow. Gotcha. Low-income families especially. Again, I think it's important for us to understand this. That we have got to get rid of this all-or-nothing approach that is largely what we have. That frankly, I was speaking to a woman in Pulaski County the other day who works in the office that hands out various among the social benefits that we offer. I will give the uh, outbreak a moment to pass. Uh, and as I said, bottom line is it's $13.48. $13.48 is the value of what an individual receives by doing nothing. This all or nothing is a bad idea. We need to encourage parents that are willing to go to work to actually receive subsidy from the federal government to incentivize them to do so. So let's say you can only get a job making eight or nine dollars an hour because you're just starting out. Maybe you didn't finish high school. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to do for yourself. Well, if you can make thirteen fifty by doing nothing and not have to pay for child care, what is your incentive to do so? The bottom line is the state should come right alongside and give the very same value for someone willing to work so that they get not the nine dollars but the nine plus the thirteen forty eight. And as they move up, this moves down and ultimately they make more. And I think this is the way we solve this problem, again, by finding solutions. This is about solutions and not rhetoric. We'll ask our audience uh, to refrain from any outbursts or any comments made uh, while the uh, <clears throat> candidates are speaking. We want to give them a maximum time. Mr. Conway? Well, I, I, I sort of addressed this in an earlier answer, Bill. Um, but the, since I've been a, a Democrat, I, I've been a long supporter of, um, of welfare reform and making certain that if people um, are on welfare that they're moving toward workfare, they're getting an education or trying to find a job or limiting the amount of time people can stay on welfare. Now we do have a program, as I mentioned, in the, in the Health and Family Services Cabinet, the Child Care Assistance Program. I don't think there's been an increase in child care assistance in about a decade. I'd have to double check that, but it's been a long time since there's been any type of assistance. And I want to get in and, in a collaborative way, look at if, if there's a possibility for an increase. Again, I can't promise everything. Money is tight in Frankfurt. But child care assistance is part of early childhood education because if a parent has an impediment to a work or an impediment to teaching, if we can get the children into child care where there are also early learning opportunities in that child care program, then I think that's a win-win that we're all looking for. Can I just touch on one thing real quickly? Again, listen tonight. Who's offering promises to look at but no promises per se? And who's offering actual solutions? There's a very big difference between what you're hearing here. Jack, the reality is you do keep making promises. And you're right, we won't be able to pay for them. And your comment that we have a surplus and that money is going to be used, trust me, in a state that has tens of billions of dollars in unfunded liability, we don't have a surplus, Jack. We don't. We are in severely, severely underfunded status as a state. We just got downgraded by S&P for exactly this reason. It is imperative that we address the financial reality today, not in the out years, by kicking this can down the road. Mr. Conway? Listen, uh, yeah, thank you for the chance for a rebuttal there. You know, I, I, I'm the only one on the stage here that's actually managed a public budget. I cut my own budget by 40 percent. I cut my budget by 40 percent. In fact, for every dollar the General Assembly gave me, we returned nearly four to the state treasury. While doing that, we, we took 800,000 child porn images off of the Internet. We shut down half the state's pain clinics. I've returned over $300 million to the state treasury. I don't need a lecture in fiscal responsibility from anybody. The fact of the matter is money is tight in Frankfurt. The sky is not falling, though. We can't afford some things, and it's a matter of priorities. Well, let me just touch on this real quickly. Again, you, you did not cut your budget, Jack. The governor cut your budget. 
You've had to deal with it. The governor is who cut your budget, Jack. But I implemented And you keep it. taking credit for it, and it's a lie. Stop lying to these people. <laughs> I'm not Stop telling Stop lying to the people, we, Jack. We cut our budget. You didn't. You didn't. We, please, Here's the, in listen, all seriousness, listen, 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 listen to this. Listen, we cut our budget we by 40%. We, we don't cut have it by a surplus, 40, Jack. We cut it by 40%. Yes. Did the legislature come along and say, here's your budget? Yeah. You know what also the reality is? For every dollar, every dollar that the General Assembly gave me, I returned almost four to the state treasury. That money we actually made returned. money for the state. We Let made money you. for the state. The money, and I, you, the and money an investment in a Conway as Attorney General was a good investment for the state because we returned over $300 million to the state treasury and were named the most aggressive Medicaid fraud unit in the country. In fairness, in fairness let's, let's have no applause, but I want to say one thing, and I apologize. No applause needed. The $300 million came by suing the very companies that we say we want to get to come to this state. Do you want a business person who's actually created jobs or a liberal attorney who is shaking people down and thinks he's going to leave this state forward. Uh, this is my question for you as viewers. I want to talk about Kentucky roadways <laughs> now and the danger of those. According to the 2015 Kentucky Annual Economic Report, 31 percent of our 14,000 bridges are considered either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. What will you do or can you do as governor to assure that our bridges are safe? Mr. Conway. Well, first of all, a lot of those bridges you're talking about, Vicki, are probably in the county road system. So uh, as governor, I know that being governor means you have to be like a big county judge. My dear friend Wendell Ford, who we Democrats honored the other night, used to say that running for governor is like running for county judge in 120 counties. So when you pick up the phone and you call into those counties, you need to know what the infrastructure needs are. Uh, you need to know what the priorities are. So I will be committed to working with local officials. Heck, I'll even be committed to working with a lot of the Republicans for Conway, pe people like Jamie Comer's home county judge, uh, Judge Willett down in Monroe County. I'll work with you on the 80-20 programs and on the flex programs to make certain that our county bridges and the infrastructure that you rely upon on a daily basis is served. And I have an outstanding running mate in, in this race. When I decided upon a running mate, I decided I wanted someone who was ready to be governor as well. She's someone that used to work in the transportation cabinet. She's both a civil engineer and a lawyer. She used to write the road plan, and she's the first woman in the history of Kentucky elected to House leadership, and she's going to be a big part of our transportation pl planning going forward. Mr. Bevan. You know, again, as I said earlier, the two things that are imperative for us to focus on in order to become the greatest version of ourselves that we can be, and this is the vision that I have for Kentucky. For us to make forward progress, not to make promises we can't deliver on, but to ensure that we do become the greatest version of Kentucky that is possible. Education and infrastructure, certainly a key component of that infrastructure, are our bridges. It's imperative that, again, we start to look at where do we get the best return on investment. We as taxpayers have got to stop allocating dollars in our legislature due to partisanship, and so often that has been the case. There is way too much politics. Regardless of who's in power, politics too often comes into play. We need to start looking at where do we get the best return on those dollars. Where is the infrastructure first most critically needed? Then where is it most essential to ensure that we can effectively move goods and services to market in a timely manner? And I will be dedicated to exactly that because I'm the only businessman in this race and I know how to spend dollars that I've actually earned as opposed to the ones that you've provided me with. Okay, we're going to need to move on and shorten your answers in this uh, question, but it is an important one. Kentucky's long reliance on coal is changing. Jobs in the coal industry have decreased by more than half since 1990. What would you do to replace jobs lost in the coal regions of our state, Mr. Bevan? Again, a short answer. Sure. The short answer is this. Never in the history of the world have we consumed more coal than we do right now. The idea that coal jobs are gone and cannot come back is a false idea. And we need to get that out of our minds because there is more demand now in the history of the world than ever. States around the country are not building these. This state certainly isn't, but around the world, it is the number one producer of electricity. Even now, 90% of these lights are powered by coal. The bridge from wherever we are to wherever we're going in the future is going to be built on the back of coal. They are building six brand new coal-fired power plants right now in Germany, 18 on the European continent. All around the world, people are doing this. Why is Kentucky not participating? If I'm the governor of this state and I intend to be, you will find not just a friend of coal, you will find somebody that will fight for coal, somebody that will stand on the 10th Amendment ability of this state, the sovereign right of this state, to mine this, turn it into electricity, and use it to create the lowest possible possible electric rates that you can have in this country. All right, we were able to give you a minute. Uh, Mr. Conway, one minute in response. <laughs> well, of the two candidates on stage here tonight, I'm the only one that's actually done anything for coal. In fact, you know, I worked for a coal governor uh, for six years in Paul Patton. 
Uh, working with him, we helped pass legislation that created thin seam tax credits for the hardest to mine coal in places like eastern Kentucky. And to the people in eastern Kentucky who are watching tonight and you want to know if someone's going to stand up for you, I want you to know this. I understand how badly you're hurting. I understand that you feel like your economy has been taken away, that jobs that were there for generations no longer are there. Uh, I'm the only Democratic Attorney General in the country to sue the EPA. I took on my own party because it was the right thing to do. As your next governor, I will try to market Kentucky coal. I will try to expand markets, maybe convert the Big Sandy to something different to use the next generation of coal. But one thing I'm also going to do, I'm going to reach across the aisle, as Steve Bashir did, and work on the SOAR initiative with Congressman Rogers. Because out of that initiative has grown an idea to bring broadband expansion through a public-private partnership first to eastern Kentucky, and that's something that I support. We need to wire eastern Kentucky both for coal jobs and the jobs of the future. We have now time for our closing statements. We want to give each candidate the opportunity to make one, and we have each have a minute to do so. Mr. Bevan, we begin with you. If you're sitting at home tonight and you're tired of the negative advertising, you're tired of the cynicism and you're tired of all of the lies that have been pounding through your airwaves, don't reward them. If you're somebody who has lost a job down in Corbin because of these 180 jobs at CSX most recently, or perhaps in Erlanger as those jobs have moved out of the state with Toyota, or down in Jamestown a year and a half ago with the Fruit of the Loom jobs, or any of the others that have been hemorrhaging out of the state, there are 71,000 fewer people working today than there were seven and a half years ago. If the path that we're on is not working for you and you want hope and you want Kentucky to be the greatest version of itself, I put myself forward and ask humbly for your vote. I'm a husband, a father of nine, a military veteran, a businessman. I'm an outsider. I'm a guy who grew up in poverty, but I have been blessed to live the American dream. And I will fight for this state and I will fight for you like I would fight for my own family. And I will serve this state like I served this nation when I wore her uniform 25 years ago. Mr. Conway. Well, thank you very much, Vicki. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to Eastern Kentucky University and the League of Women Voters and these two television stations. Uh, to my beautiful daughters, Eva and Alex at home, I just want to say Daddy loves you and I'll be home to tuck you in tonight. Uh, folks, we've been through some tough times together these last six or seven years. But Governor Bashir has actually had a very steady hand through some very difficult, difficult economic times. But we now are having 88% of our people graduate from high school. Dropout rates are down. Kentucky's educational progress is significant. Just last year, Site Selection Magazine names Kentucky the best place to do business. On a per capita basis for new business filings, we're number two in the country. We have something to build on, not something to tear down. I want to work with you going forward. Go to ConwayOverly.com. Check out my jobs plan. Check out my education plan. Together, we can focus on early childhood education. And I humbly, humbly ask for your vote on November the 3rd. We would like to thank the candidates, as well as Eastern Kentucky University, our host tonight, the League of Women Voters of Kentucky, as well, for being a part of tonight's debate. And don't forget to vote Tuesday, November 3rd. For more information about the elections, go to WLKY.com and WKYT.com. Thanks for being with us. Good night.